Um, the term foodways is a relatively recent term, um, and it's really caught on. I think it's one of the things in the field of folklore that has its own kind of cachet and is really picked up in different ways. It returns, replaced a term in the 1950s that was called folk, folk cookery, <laughs> yeah, which just doesn't sound as cool as foodways. Um, so I'd like to talk to you a little bit about what foodways is and how we study it and how it can be used in the classroom. Um, in your guide, I've got a few books that will be useful to you. I really like Lucy Long's Ethnic Foods Today. Um, that one's in there. It's a nice encyclopedia um, that she produced, and it covers a whole range of food traditions from uh, the United States of different cultures coming in and maintaining their different foods, and it's a great reference source, so I think you'll find that useful in the classroom. So it's Ethnic American Food Today, a Cultural Encyclopedia by Lucy Long. And I'll set that to you. <laughs> um, one of the things that has happened is food studies have really opened up, and it's something very accessible in your community, uh, that everybody has a lot of different food traditions and there's a variety. And one of the things that's showing up with foodways is an interest in the idea that it's traditional foods that have been passed along over time, and usually it's the family that's very much a center for this. So think of the family recipes you have. One idea might be just to make a family recipe book of things that your students have brought in and find local cooks and have them share um, their food traditions with you. But it also includes the different kinds of traditions associated with food. Um, so we're looking at traditional foods and uh, traditions with food. And you might find that there's like secret sauces for barbecue. You might want to think how you're going to serve barbecue. Does it be, is it going to be tomato or mustard base? Uh, dry rub, um, wet, all these things that people have big arguments and just about led to the separation of two different states in North Carolina. <laughs> um, uh, there was a big controversy about the official barbecue sauce of whether it was mustard-based or tomato-based, and I'm not sure that's fully resolved in Carolina. Um, we got similar factional differences in our region between dry rub and wet sauce on it, so people can take the stand whichever you feel is important on that. Um, another one that you run into some really local traditions with foods, like where do you put the coleslaw when you have your sandwich? Um, so now <laughs> I'm noticing over and over that you go to these barbecue places, and the big question um, is where do you want your slaw? <laughs> um, that's kind of changed because 10 years ago it was just they put it in the sandwich, um, and, and now as people are kind of into it, you see those varieties. Um, so there's a wide variety of these, and I think you can get these things going in the classroom in different areas. Um, I think folklorists tend to be interested in the vernacular food traditions in various communities. So we'd like um, some interest in the whole range of food in everyday life, but we tend to break away some the more elitist and kind of five-star restaurant approaches in, in looking at food. And we just look at vernacular food in everyday life. And I think this is really kind of picking up with an interest in like the do-it-yourself movement. Um, so as people are looking at the um, everyday chefs and the idea of food being something that is, is a part of these communities is real central to it. Um, and what I'd like to do is give you an idea of some of the things that we look at in terms of, of food. And I thought I'd start off with the idea of food showing up um, in material culture. Um, so since we've got uh, focus here on the river, um, I'd start down in New Orleans and work our way up. And we have the cornstalk fence um, here. And one of the things that you see in New Orleans is a real emphasis on culinary tourism and uh, the importance of food traditions in New Orleans, that it's a major draw. Um, and you'll have tours that the Louisiana State Museum uh, does to their 1850s house in the quarter, and it tends to emphasize a lot of um, songs, buildings, and foods, and occasionally songs about buildings and foods as part of it. So you want to look at these cultural complexes that blend together in the study of foodways. Um, so uh, you can't really avoid that with a trip down to New Orleans. Um, and of course, you run into the real famous things like beignets at the Café du Monde. Um, I was noticing this is right across, um, or right on the land from John's wonderful photo of Algiers, um, right there with the beignet makers. And part of these tours will give you a chance to see uh, behind the scenes um, in imagery in New Orleans. And you notice New Orleans is just known for its food, of course, that you come back from New Orleans, and one of the big questions is, so, what did you eat? <laughs> <clears throat> Um, so you've got the cities with this, but then I think another thing is to look at the local traditions. And what I want to do is show you some ideas of things right in your area here that you can pick up on. Um, not far from where I live in Jonesboro, there's Harrisburg, about 20 miles down the road, and you have the Parker Pioneer um, Homestead. And it's its own do-it-yourself living history activity, 
And in the fall, they have a sorghum making um, exhibition. And I think it's a wonderful event. Um, it's a great little food fest, but it covers a whole variety of different food traditions that you can check out. And that's become a site for a lot of um, field trips. Um, I've taken my Heritage Studies students there, and I'll show you some of the things going on here of why I think this would be um, an interesting idea um, of things that you can do. And you may find families that have sorghum making as part of their traditions can bring them in as what Barbara Kirsch and Black Gimlet calls indigenous educators. Uh, they've got something to share with you. Um, it's a two-week event that they'll have, and they're interpreting regional food traditions. So you look at a lot of the idea of region in these food traditions, and it began um, largely as a way to keep the sorghum making alive. And now I think the heritage, the sorghum is part of the heritage, has become a heritage art. The, they're very consciously practicing the art and maintaining it. Um, as, a, as a symbol of heritage. And you tend to run into these heritage arts that will show up with these kinds of festivals, um, that many times arts are done specifically for display to preserve them in festivals. And you have resurgence in arts like blacksmithing that are very much based in these two. Um, so you can see a whole variety of different traditions going on there. Um, the Sorghum uses a living history approach. It's an open air museum uh, that is part of a whole folk museum ideas that originate in the 19th century and then uh, have picked up in the US. Um, so you can look at these folk life museums as resources for teaching. Um, I like the grinding that takes place in the old mills, um, and you can watch that taking place. Um, they'll typically do it with horse-drawn or mule-drawn um, approaches around there. Um, other places are revitalizing this, and it's um, difficult to find people who know how to work with draft animals. So I've seen the sorghum taking place now with riding lawnmowers. <laughs> and they'll zip around there with the riding lawnmower. Hey, if it works, that's progress. Um, I think uh, folklore um, is really about a contemporary art with an interesting tradition. And it's not so much trying to bring back something from the past and live the way things used to be. It's rather looking at tradition as a part of everyday life. So if they're using riding lawnmowers instead of mules, but doing that with sorghum, that's, that's the way it works. Um, you can see as they're grinding the syrup, um, or the, the juice to make the syrup, um, that they'll explain it to you. There's a lot of on-site interpretation. Um, and again, I invite you to dig into your community and see who you can find who are the local authorities who would be able to explain things like this and have them educate and, and talk about how this takes place. Um, now a lot of the work that they have, it's become so successful, they actually have industrial grinders that come in and they grind out the juice and then they boil it down there. But they'll still have the interpreters um, explaining a little bit um, of the background and you can engage your students in asking questions and have them work as field workers and just um, pick it up in kind of very structured field trip that, that works that way. Um, there's a whole element of the syrup making that I find fascinating. The cooking, these skills are passed along and they become syrup masters. Um, so they're actually trained on the site and it becomes a family tradition. And then uh, you can get them explaining it and looking for things like the terminology of um, how they know um, when to pull the syrup um, with a, its own kind of nifty folk terminology like the hominy hop, or down in Florida they call it horse eyes. And it all refers to the texture of the syrup as they're making it. Got a little reflexivity there with one of my Heritage Studies students doing a photograph, and I'm taking her photograph. So um, this is a type of thing you can do, is to invite your students to go out and photograph a local event, or taste it. Um, Kathy Neustadt talks about the value of these kinds of foodways events, and she says that one of the things that's great about studying foodways is it's multi-sensory, and we tend to just analyze and interpret and take an intellectual analysis. But she says, you know, that's not quite what food's about. Food's about tasting. Um, and she has a wonderful article that uses the metaphor of licking um, as a way of exploring food. <laughs> um, and you can see like the idea of sampling sorghum coming off, that there's a folkloristics of licking here uh, that we're proud to share, um, including my international friend Chen Bing Song in the background, who was too shy to be foreground licking. Um, <laughs> so you've got different cultural complexes going along, and they have a whole variety of crafts. So another heritage art that they do in the family, um, Parker family, is broom making. Um, so you can see a whole variety of things and get your students to go out and document these traditions um, that are connected to the folk life. Um, I want to head up about 40 miles north of here to Pocahontas and show you another event. Um, and this is held at the Annie May Heron Center, which is an African-American community center in Pocahontas. And they're having it this month. I think it may be either next week 
or the week after, I'm not sure exactly when. Um, but I was there a couple times, and they do a hog killing. Um, they do it, pardon the pun, very tastefully. Um, but they'll dress out the hog on the ground after dispatching it on site. And it becomes a community gathering. And what they'll do is they do this as a pig picking. Um, and it's a big part of the African American community. And one of the things I like about this is it's a very integrated event. Um, and you have the older masters, the ones who really understand the tradition of butchering, teaching the new generation there too. And it becomes a site of a community outreach. Um, as you have this going on, it becomes its own community festival to support the center. Um, and I won't show you anything that's too graphic, so hang on if your stomach's a little squeamish, but nothing you wouldn't see in the grocery store. Um, but I'd like you to keep in mind of how communities are formed in these events and how these community events are oftentimes centered around food. Um, it's one of the things I think that really interests uh, people in the study of food ways. Um, they have the butchers who are going to show the different cuttings. And one of the things that happens is a real respect for the knowledge of the older people who know how to do these arts. And oftentimes you have the younger generation just not at all knowing the cuts of meat or where the food comes from. Um, and there's a respect for that knowledge, um, especially in these rural communities, I think is really important. Um, you oftentimes hear people saying, well, this butcher has forgotten more things than I ever knew <laughs> about processing meat. Um, and they'll go through the process and explain the use of the different organ meats. Um, one of the things that happens is there's a vestige of the past um, that I get really interested in the language and the terminology. So the lungs aren't called the lungs, the lungs are called the lights. Um, and it turns out that's an old term that goes way back possibly medieval time and that's hung on um, in these communities. I've seen it in Arkansas and Florida and other places I've done field work. Um, so they'll do these kinds of things and they also have little stages of activities including um, making the cracklings. Um, so they'll demonstrate how the cracklings are made and you can see this being part of stirring the pot, um, literally. Um, and working out the cracklings to prepare them ahead of time that you'll see these regional variations of something that's really a strong marker of southern regional culture of making the cracklings and sharing the recipes along with that. Um, and it's fascinating to watch how this is made and to pick up the whole sensory experience of the smells and the sights. Um, I think that's a real engaging part, of course, of the food ways. Um, and then one of the things that they do, this is Pat Johnson who directs um, the center and organizes the event. Um, she really tries to make it a community event and she wants to involve the local knowledge here. Um, so the event will end with a auction. And what they do is they invite the local auctioneer to come in and set them an auction and then people will bid on it and all the proceeds go for uh, supporting the center itself. Um, so I think what we have here is a good example of an entire cultural complex, a whole variety of things. And my suggestion is to tap into those networks, um, look at the communities where people gather, see how it's connected to food and a whole range of activities. And then that's a way of drawing this into the classroom and make connections between um, your classroom and the content of the local community. Um, this is, we've been looking at the river. Um, this is inland right on Crowley's Ridge, but these are the types of things that would also occur um, in river communities or, or other communities here. And I think that sense of engagement and participation from the audience and the idea of the auctioneer um, coming in and donating some time and setting up a whole auction, making this work, is really um, ways of doing some integrative curriculum and, and ways that can be pretty exciting. Um, I'll close by going up north and just because I like this photo. <laughs> um, but I was up in Blue Earth, Minnesota, um, and it really is like the earth is blue there. Um, it's a very rich soil, and um, it's a center for the jolly green giant. And I've been interested in some of these roadside signs, um, and it struck me how so many of these roadside signs are related to food, um, that you see it all throughout the area of uh, roadside signs and uh, the old signs for advertising. That uh, I think that'd be another thing to kind of tap into, um, that you can look at the idea of um, these local-based traditions and how central food is to it um, and uh, integrate that in your curriculum. I'd be happy to talk to you about it and give you some resources. Thank you. That's great. So, Gregory, I've got a couple of questions, and maybe we can uh, move this to some conversation here. But, but I do think one of the one of the wonderful things about food that, as a as a locus, both for research, for community, for for teaching, is that 
that it's a it, there's something universal about an interest in how people deal with food or what the way in which food often is the center of the table literally and and then gets people around it uh, whether that is a big community whether it's a volunteer fire department having a fish fry or a, a, what you showed of um, the hog killing at a community center but there is something that that is um, it's very accessible and it's somewhat universal even in its most so I guess what I would um, what would be interesting to talk about a little bit is the the more you would move closer to the river and th and just imagine the riverine um, traditions that might be these communal traditions and they might be fish fries they might they probably at this point and this is something that's a, a very interesting evolution that's happened y you know we've seen photographs of catfish and David just just sung about the catfish but you know, the catfish was never, uh, uh, didn't have a, a, a lot of, of uh, stature on the, the hierarchy of fish. It's a bottom feeder. And just like in any other, any society, there is a hierarchy of, of wild food sources and certainly of fish. And, and the catfish was always at the, maybe not totally at the bottom, but close. Um, and with... With aquaculture, there was a real attempt to, to reorient the position of the catfish. Which, what that did, to some extent, um, an, a, another consequence of that was it made a real division between those who would go to a catfish house where it was all farm-raised catfish and those people who intentionally would want to buy river fish. You go to a river community, and I've met many people who have no interest, as they would say, in eating a fish that has been fed hog feed. <laughs> That's quote unquote means a, a farm raised fish. They want a natural fish, like a natural tuning of the guitar. They want a natural fish. Um, other people think of that as uh, that's what they're trying to, to, to get away from. And I think these, these kinds of uh, sentiments are, are fascinating to look at because they're not static, as you just said. There's, you know, just as the, uh, the, the riding lawnmower replaces the, the mule. Uh, the, the, the catfish industry is, is in really bad shape right now. It's much cheaper if you live in Rosedale, Mississippi to buy river fish than it is to go to Kroger and buy fish. Um, if you think it's better and it's cheaper, then the fish fry may well be around that. But do you see those kinds of things in other communities, you know, those, the, those sort of drifting tensions yeah. Um, we certainly see in the farm-to-table movement more and more young people, sort of college-educated suburbanites, wanting to be closer to their food. Yeah. Um, I, I really liked what you and John have been talking about in terms of commercial fishing, um, because I've done some field work with commercial fishers, and I think that center point of starting at an entry point and starting small and observing it and going from there is real important in food ways. And I've done quite a bit of field work with commercial fishermen on the Mississippi and Ohio. And one of the things that shows up over and over again is that they like being their own boss. And a lot of them had maybe worked in a factory and didn't like it, but they like the freedom of being uh, commercial fishing on the, on the river. But the other side of that is it's great to be out on the river and I like boats and all that. But a big part of the big commercial fisherman is cleaning them up. <laughs> and you might spend two or three hours chopping off heads and slitting catfishes, which isn't quite as attractive as, the, as that side. But I think one of the things that's happening is that if you think small and think into this, that there is a local market for that. And some of the things that we've forgotten of local communities and local economies really can come back and make that viable. So I, I find it real interesting that you can actually get a better deal by talking to the independent uh, fisher and you don't have to go to industries. And I think that's part of this bigger, wide movement. One of the things that happens is they sell a lot of sorghum, for example, at the Homestead Day, and it sells out, so they really have to do industrial milling on their side of grind all this juice and then cook it down. But people will go there sometimes just to get their supply of sorghum for the year. You know? mm -hmm. So I think that's happening with a sense of buying local and going back and trying to create an economic support for these small-scale industries that are getting replaced by other ones. And it's interesting that sometimes the economy of scale might work. Right, right. You also come on, and, and, and you know, in Foodways, I, I have um, 
it's it's important, I think, when looking at, at food traditions to not just be interested in those things one likes. And I'll use a, an example of, uh, I mean, how many people in here, you know, like to eat garfish? Probably. Probably. You, so, so some, a few people maybe. Um, and, but, but eating gar, alligator gar, a, a kind of another a fish that doesn't have a whole lot of status in the fish world and the in the human relationship to the fish world, is something that that river folks have done for a long, long time. And when we did um, years ago, the Mississippi Delta was a part of the. Uh, Smithsonian Festival of American Folklife on the Mall. I think it was 1996. And uh, so we, there was a number of commercial fishermen that were in Washington talking about things like this and making nets. And, and one guy was cooking gar every day for like 10 days on the Mall. And, and uh, we shipped, you know, <laughs> river fish up to, to Washington so he could cook and demonstrate. And, and it was kind of extraordinary to watch. I mean, there's a, there's a way that gar is fixed into... Uh, basically croquettes. They call them gar balls, but they're basically like a salmon croquette uh, made out of gar meat. Um, and another way, he would bake it in aluminum foil. And I always loved the way when he, when he unveiled it, it had this really dense um, texture. Um, and I'm not saying it did, was like this, but he would say, it's just like lobster. <laughs> now that's a big stretch from a gar to a lobster. But as soon as he said it, I looked, and you know the way that that lobster flakes off in, in chunks, not in, uh, not in little, the gar does a very similar thing. Um, there's a whole science to the cleaning of a gar. It has a mud vein. So my point is there's just an enormous amount of, of traditional knowledge among communities that is easy to sort of say, well, who would want to do that? Which is really not the point, I think. The point is, where does that tradi traditional knowledge take us? Um, what can we learn about economic status, about subsistence fishing, about if you're a fisherman on a, on a, uh, if you're a commercial fisherman on a, on a small river, you're sure not going to go buy your fish uh, at, at the Kroger. You're going to eat whatever you catch, and you're probably going to eat what you can't sell. And this is, this would be the case with fishermen in saltwater communities as well as freshwater communities. We so often forget uh, the way in which these big rivers and small rivers are sustenance on that kind of level, on a really small level. Um, and I think there's enormous opportunities. Yeah, I wanted to mention with uh, discovering our Delta project that the Smithsonian had done that project of looking at different areas and states and then bringing them into Washington, D.C. for two weeks for the Smithsonian Folklife Festival. But um, a really great resource for use in the classroom is discovering our Delta. And it's in your um, guidebook um, as one of the resources. And you can just Google it <laughs> by discovering our Delta Smithsonian. And it should pop up. And there's a nice video that goes along with that that shows how to do it. And you really do see the importance of food in the river um, as part of that. And then you can also download teacher's guides. And these are classroom-tested lesson plans. They work. Um, I do a lot of workshops. and usually the teachers will come out and saying, well, this is stuff that I can use in a classroom. And I said, yeah, because I do. <laughs> you know, that really, um, we have a whole group of people going and doing that. And I think the Smithsonian's resources are great because um, they're doing it with museum educators and they have teachers involved to make it happen. Um, and um, once you get into those networks of kind of place-based local learning, um, it really opens up a, a lot of great activities that, that can take place. And I, I like your point, too, about looking at the universal but also the specific. And, and you're right, food really does that because what some of the most visceral reactions you have to culture are related to food um, and a sense of you want the exotic or the difference and you want to kind of use that as an entry point to explore. But then on the other hand, after a while, you kind of want to go back to what you're used to a little bit just because it fills a home. Right. You know? um, and I think that's kind of that part of that interest in field work and general ways of looking at things, comparing what is different, unusual, and then finding a reference place to yourself. And I think that's an important part of education in general. And there's some great examples, recent examples of things that we now accept, or we, the, the culinary world. I mean, redfish, for instance, blackened redfish. I mean, redfish was not seen as a restaurant food until, um, until New Orleans, and basically Paul Proudhon made it so, and then it had to be everywhere, and we almost 
overfished the redfish uh, ecosystems. So there, there, there are ways, I mean, who would have thought that pork belly would be on as many menus as it is? If you would have tried to predict that 15 years ago, people would have said, what, you know, I don't want to eat any pork belly appetizers. And now it's on every cool, young chef's menu. Uh, so there's, a, there's, an, there's an evolutionary um, opportunity there. And there's also the obvious connection, which we just saw wasn't programmed, but the connection between food and song, where you see some of this showing up in song and, and, and song being about food or using food metaphors. Um, we've got a few minutes left, so I'm going to open it up for questions, because otherwise we'll run out of uh, space and time or comments. I mean, this is something everybody knows something about. And we could, we could go around the room probably right now and discover that everybody has uh, some particular uh, foodways traditions within family, within region. Um, we, we're eating microphones up here. Yeah, <laughs> perfect. I've got one roaming if there's any questions. You don't have a single, this one's not on, is it? Yeah, I couldn't get it to work. You couldn't get it to work? Oh, I think it's on. Is it on? I don't think it Does is. Does anybody have a gar oh, recipe they want to share? It is. <laughs> or, I, gar. I found some things that are similar or, to what you talked about. Or, there. or how do people eat catfish? How many people like catfish? I think we have a question. Over okay, there. we got a question. Here's here we go. Here we go. <laughs> Finally. Can you can you speak to the somewhat eclectic nature of Mississippi River Delta food in general? And and I say that talking about and you'll know what I'm talking about things like places like Uncle John's in, in Crawfordsville that are traditional Delta eateries that are Italian based and then over in Mississippi the concept of the of the Delta tamales, tamales. that are yeah. uh, little, I think yeah. that's really a unique thing with the entire Delta as a yeah. whole. So so there, it's a great question because this is a perfect so when the the, the Delta um, I think David said this last night uh, in the uh, in the early in 1910, 1920, up in the through the 30s, at at cotton picking time, when when there was a shortage of labor, all kinds of people came into the Delta. Well, there's there's great photographs from from uh, Bolivar County of Mexican work camps on plantations, and when those Mexican work camps, when Mexicans came in to help pick cotton, and were in work situations with African Americans and and poor whites who were also picking cotton. All kinds of things happen. Recipes, foodways, changes. Tamales came that way. They came through labor. They came through uh, those kind of ethnic mixings. We often you know, make a mistake of thinking, well, the Delta, the Mississippi Delta, for instance, is, most, is you know, black and white. Uh, well, it, it, it is, but in the late 19th century, um, Italians were recruited with, as indentured servants. There were advertisements to bring Italians to Arkansas and Mississippi, where you get a lot of Italian restaurants in, in the Mississippi Delta and probably in the Arkansas Delta too, is from the, that. Catholic churches, why does, why does Shaw, Mississippi have this big Catholic church? And now those, those families are landowners, they're some of the bigger farmers, but, it, but they came with a whole other story. So one of the things that, that is important to to really assume everywhere is that anywhere, every place is more diverse than it looks like on the surface. Um, and then you have to kind of get, get there. But you're right, if you go to some of these restaurants and you sort of trace backwards, you would get uh, to that level. The Southern Foodways Alliance has done great work uh, doing this through oral histories and through uh, family histories. Uh, we could go on and on with with similar kinds of stories, but the Delta Tamale is a great one, and it's, um, I don't know how many people understand, and it's not like you can find the person who had the recipe, you know, it's like, it's not like we're gonna uh, find out, you know, who, who wrote the first version of X song, who made the first tamale, uh, but we can see how it happened. And a lot of this also is linked to ways of getting at history, so when you're looking at the idea of tamales in the Delta, 
the thing that it's going to open up is a lot of regional ethnic histories there, and that becomes a great entry point to that. One of the things that surprised me, too, is the prevalence of Chinese communities and Chinese food in the Delta. And I thought it was just a relatively recent thing. It's like, nope, that goes way yeah, back. Way yeah. back. And you'll see that in the Discovering Our Delta part. Um, I think along with that, too, is in food ways, we tend to be interested a lot in the regional foods. So like the idea of different ways of preparing foods and are you going to smoke a gar or pickle it or whatever you're going to do to that <laughs> um, of kind of creative ways of making do. But we also have a lot of interest in the ethnic foods. So there's a lot of interest in ethnic history and looking at connections between ethnic histories, ethnic culture, and regional culture is real important in, in a place like the Delta. It's, 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 it is a lot more diverse than people um, think. Yeah, I think it's uh, it's it's an important. I mean, there's we food is is probably the quickest way into understanding some of that, and it's also the uh, the most universal or the most you know it's it's the easiest road in. It's the easiest door to open. Everybody likes to talk about food, um, and we all ultimately like to eat it. And and uh, if you fry anything right, you can eat it. No, that's not true. 